Nearman Condition, the home of Collected oh, Edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. How's it going, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And join me today for my overview of the complete irredeemable by Mark Wade from Boom Studios. So, join me. So, what we're looking at here is the latest edition of Irredeemable from Boom Studios. This has been previously released, of course, in single issues, and it's been previously released in trade paperbacks. There were these five premiere edition hardcovers, and believe it or not, this contains more issues than these books, but not the extras that these books contain. So, kind of give you a better understanding as to how thick this book is. So, they are going to be releasing hardcovers, I believe, later on this year. They were kickstarted, as well as the Incorruptible, which is the series that also came out in a softcover and will be coming out in another softcover called The Complete Incorruptible. This is the sister series to Irredeemable. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about this when talking about this. But the thing is that the books that they kickstarted are going to be standard size so they're going to be the size of marvel masterworks so a standard size hardcover that's from everything i've read and seen so far i mean i don't know they could change their minds but i believe it, they're all going to be standard size and they will be available through retailers both irredeemable in hardcover and incorruptible in hardcover but again those that are coming out later this year will be coming out in a standard size hardcover. Now, Incorruptible was never collected in this size format book. There was only in trade paperbacks and then this big omnibus edition, which again will be reprinted as the complete Incorruptible. I believe it comes out in September. All right, let's shift the focus back to this. In case you're not familiar with these big compendium type books, some Publishers called them omnibus editions like Dark Horse and IDW. Manga publishers have used the word omnibus. Doesn't necessarily mean oversized hardcover that we've come to expect from Marvel or DC. So that's why I like doing overviews like this so people know ahead of time exactly what they're getting. This is the trim size of a trade paperback. So the pages are the exact same dimensions of a trade, meaning that it's the exact same dimensions of a floppy, a single issue. Of course, whoa, <laughs> huge, huge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a big book. And as I always like to stress, the problem with the big books that are in soft cover, because this is a soft cover, glued binding, is that the more you open it up, the more it could crack that spine. But this, the, I'm not sure what they're using here. It seems like it's sturdier soft cover than what they used here. This seems a little bit flimsier. So not like a traditional trade paperback. It's a little sturdier than that. But doesn't mean that the spine won't crack, right? It, it might just keep it from cracking. And honestly, the build of these compendiums over the years have gotten a lot better. Long gone are the days of like Witchblade compendiums or the Walking Dead compendiums that just kind of fell apart and then of course had that crease. The only one that I had problems with was the Spawn Compendium Volume 2 that actually cracked the spine. All right, um, let's take a closer look at this, though. So here we have a cover by John Cassidy, Mark Wade, Peter Krause, and Andrew Dollhouse, Irredeemable, the complete. This gets a little bit confusing because down here it says the Deluxe Edition Library. It's like throwing in a bunch of words. I I'm not sure what, the what that means. I think calling it just a complete irredeemable would be fine. And here you get a little more credits down here. Some of the other creators that helped out on the book, the Boom Studios logo, irredeemable, and the complete. All the way in the back, some praise for, of course, the story, the ultimate edition of the Eisner Award-winning superhero saga, and then the retail price, $59.99. Now, the book doesn't come wrapped in plastic, nor does it give a mature rating. Let me just double check. Nope, not down there. But this is definitely mature content. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to be talking about, I mean, we're going to be looking 
at the first four issues, like doing a deep dive of the first four issues, because I want people to be hooked on this. If you don't want to know anything about Irredeemable and you're just buying it on a blind because you've heard everybody praise it, you've heard everybody say this is the best Mark Wade book, this is better than Watchmen, you know, just go ahead, buy it and read it. Don't, don't get spoiled by anything. But if you want to know what the pitch is and exactly what makes Irredeemable stand out, I'm going to be doing a deep dive of the first couple of issues, probably first four or five. And then, of course, there's a lot more that happens because this is the 37 issues plus the special collected in here. And just in case I have to say it, yes, there will be some talk of some spoilers giving you the pitch and the premise and setting up the world of Irredeemable. Okay, let's go ahead and jump right in. Let's go ahead and get the book opened here. Mark Wade, Peter Krause, the creators of Irredeemable, Deluxe Edition. Yep, sure. Uh, Irredeemable, and here are the creators, written by Mark Wade. Here's all the artists working on the book, the colorist, and the letter Ed Dukeshire. Covers by John Cassidy and Laura Martin. Here is your table of contents. You have an introduction here by Kemp Powers, and you have the crossover here with Incorruptible. That is collected in here as well as the special. And then you have the afterword by Grant Morrison, which was written, I think, after the first volume or the first issue. Here's your forward by Kent Powers talking about how when uh, he was a kid with friends, they would choose who their favorite superhero was or who they wanted to be, like in the Justice League style. And he found it really difficult to pick Superman. You can find out why through that introduction. This collects Irredeemable 1 through 37, the Irredeemable Special number 1, and Incorruptible 25 and 26. So that is what's collected in here. Now again, this has mature content, and there's some really difficult imagery at first, so that involves a child. And I always like to give a heads up to my viewers, because I understand and respect people that can't watch kids or animals get hurt. Um, but I do want to give... Just a little bit of a heads up for that because we are jumping right into the story, what this is about. All right, so here we go. This is the Plutonian. The Plutonian is the main character of this book. It is what Irredeemable is named after pretty much. And he is your Superman type of character. And his powers are a little bit different, but we won't get into that. That comes later. And then you see Hornet running into his child's room, screaming, Sarah, wake up, we gotta get out of here. And Hornet is a member of the Paradigm. And the Paradigm is like your Justice League. There's a Hawkman type of character, there's a character like Green Arrow in there. And you'll, you'll get the idea here in a little bit. But he's running in here and he's waking up his family, he tells his wife to get the kid, and he's like, listen, we have to get out of here. We have to leave now. He knows everything. He knows about our identities. He knows who we are. And we turn to the next page and we see the Plutonian's eyes just light up and pretty much kill his wife and baby. So he escapes out of the house and coming out of the ground is the Plutonian. And he's like, look, you know, Hornet is not begging for his life. He understands what's going to happen. He's begging for his child's life. Man, that is such a dark moment here. And the Plutonian just fries him then he walks over to his daughter to the hornet's daughter and he asks her do you know who i am sarah i'm a superhero and kills her off screen and flies away the next we see is one week later here where the plutonian is pretty much destroying this robot that has a nuclear reactor inside that's threatening to blow up a stadium he's overhearing things and he you know, he hears all the praises for him, but in the audience, somebody he whisp somebody saying he's just a flippin' underwear pervert, show-off jerk. So it's really interesting what he's focusing on. Now, what we see here is we see the members of the Paradigm, and they're questioning one of their other members. So this is where it gets really interesting. This is Sam Sarah, who's kind of like the Plutonian's sidekick. He's like his Robin, his 
um, his Bucky. And they're questioning if he remembers anything that could have made the Plutonian snap. Because all we know so far, as the reader, is that this once superhero is killing not just his team members, but innocent people along the way. And as the more you read, the more you get to find out that he's already destroyed cities. And one thing that I, when reading this, I love doing deep dives of these stories. When the Hornet's begging for his child's life, he's like, she's only a little girl. And the Plutonian's like, I know exactly what she is. She's a carbon bag of atoms and bioelectricity. And reading that makes you immediately think that this guy has distanced himself from humanity. Like he is, he doesn't care what these people are. They're not people anymore. They're just things to be toyed with. So the rest of the team of the Paradigm is here interrogating this character that was once a member of their team, Samsara. And he's having the hardest time like remembering anything that could have made the Plutonian snap, any of his weaknesses. And as you find out, because of his power of sort of immortality, he keeps coming back from the dead. What the Plutonian, the, like what he ended up doing to him was giving him a lobotomy. Pretty much making his brain completely dead, meaning he can't remember anything. So the rest of the team just kind of gives him peace and they bury him, knowing that he can't die. And they're sitting around going, you know, if he did that to his best friend or his sidekick, can you imagine what he's going to do to the rest of us? Again, you're thrown into this mystery. You don't know why this one superhero, this Superman godlike character is snapping and killing former team members and going on a rampage and, and destroying the world. And each issue, you'll have a little bit of a flashback, kind of filling in more and more. You get to know more of the characters, too. Like, this is the story of Caden. Now, Caden looks a little bit different in the present. This is her past. But she has a really cool power, too. You get to find out more about their powers. She can summon legendary heroes um, from Japan, Japan to do her bidding. And she's kind of a badass, too. So her mission is to go and find the Plutonian's Earth girlfriend and ask her, you know, was do you know of any weaknesses that we can use against the Plutonian? And then she has her own backstory about how the Plutonian pretty much, you know, swept her off her feet at this dance and they had many adventures. So, yes, you're probably immediately thinking, oh, it's Lois Lane to Superman because the Plutonian himself has his own human identity, a secret identity named Dan. And as you come to find out, it's not exactly like Lois and Clark. There's a lot of betrayal in here that kind of makes the Plutonian snap. Now, is it the thing that makes him snap? Well, that's the big question. Then you get to find out a little bit more about the Plutonian. Like he's dressing up these people right here, forcing them to have sexual relations, if you will, as he watches. One of them obviously looking like him and the other one with this black wig that could look like Bet Noir, who is a former team member of him, of his, and you know he's even writing their dialogue, and they're both like, "I don't want to do this," and the guy's like, "Look, you have to do this, or he's going to kill us. You have to say this line." So that you get to find out a little bit more about him and possibly what could have made him snap. There's all these mysteries about the book that I really enjoyed. You, you're thrown right into, like I said, the beginning is just him wiping out a team member. This is a couple of the other team members. They're the twins. You have Skyla and you have Cher Cheribis? Cher Cheribis, that's it. Uh, but he goes by Carrie. Now, both these brothers have similar powers. They can throw uh, kinetic energy out, energy beams. And you get to see a little bit more of their backstory in the third issue. And the third issue is the one that hooked me. Uh, because I think a lot of people get hooked on the ending of the first issue. And I didn't even show that. Uh, but the ending of the third issue, to me, uh, really, really puts things into perspective. Because at this moment, it's still a mystery as to why he's gone bad. Here you have a group of villains. And they've broken into Martin Reber's house. Now, Martin Reber was a superhero named Inferno. He's was a rich billionaire playboy but also had a superhero alter ego so yes very much like your batman now inferno got his head punched in by 
the plutonian so he's dead so the villains are in here and they're trying to steal some stuff uh seeing if things are worthy of stealing what they could flip what they could sell and they're talking about how the plutonian could be one of them now they don't know that the brothers are outside so you have carrie and skyla listening in on the conversation so what skyla does is he goes inside while his brother stays outside talking back to the rest of the team and what the team leader at this time cubit does so i haven't really talked about cubit but i will here in a little bit he gave them these teleporting devices where they can just jump back to the secret base without the plutonian knowing any better but Skyla's inside with the villains, and he wants to know exactly what's going on. And then the Plutonian shows up, just making some coffee, and sits down and starts talking to them. Because, again, the villains think, like, oh, maybe he's one of us. Maybe he wants to become a supervillain, and we should just let him in. And others are like, no, we can't trust him. He wants world domination. So as he's sitting down drinking coffee, one of them goes for the gun, and the Plutonian just kind of blows his hand off. So what he does with the rest of the villains is he gives them a choice. He gives them this device that was supposed to be created by inferno because if if inferno is the plutonian's batman to his superman then you know that inferno has figured out a way to defeat the plutonian so what he does is he gives him these devices with a button and this button is supposed to be like a kill switch to destroy and kill the plutonian now, he's giving them a choice. He's asking them, you can either hit the button or you can join me at my side. Before he can even finish his sentence, they all hit the button. And of course, the Plutonian was lying. He tells them pretty much that, hey, what you just activated was the self-destruct mechanism to this place. So keep in mind, like I said, one of the brothers is still there. You still have Skyla there while Carrie's outside with a teleporter and Skyla's can't get out on time so the whole place explodes with the plutonian right in the middle of course not even getting a scratch and the only person left alive is the encanta which is one of the villains she's kind of like your magic user like your zatanna and he's so creepy he just goes up to her and she's like don't hurt me and i'll do anything and he's like huh wonder what you would look like in a wig so you kind of know where that goes again in, in the fourth issue and this is the last one i'm going to go in deep about this is a little bit of a flashback this shows a little bit more of cubit and the plutonians relationship they were really good friends as everyone on the team thought of him you know they, they thought of him as a friend they thought of him as a good guy so much so that they would call him tony you know short for plutonian and uh, i thought that was really cool to see this relationship and then what happens later on but the flashbacks really help flesh out, you know, how these people feel about the Plutonian, who could be of a different planet, who could be raised here on Earth, who could be a byproduct of some kind of scientific experiment. But you can find out for yourself. Now, you've seen him deal with superheroes. You've seen him deal with supervillains. You've seen him in the second issue deal with the public. What happens when the world's governments, like the UN, get together and start to decide what to do with the Plutonian? This is where it gets really interesting. This is where the world leaders are deciding, okay, let's just go ahead and say we team up and everything we throw at the Plutonian. We got to make sure we get rid of this menace no matter what. However, some of the world leaders are like, no, absolutely not. I think it's our moment to let him lead our countries like nigeria steps up and other countries start stepping up no we need him to become world leader like japan stay, uh, stands up and says no he should lead japan he's perfect for the job so the last person to stand up is singapore which he chooses at random and says what what do you offer me and singapore of course tells him you know uh we offer you peace we offer you our country we offer you money and he wants to know why and the senator from singapore says Be because we seek your strength and your guidance in a hostile world now the plutonian much like superman can hear people's heartbeats so he knows if somebody's telling the truth or lying and he can definitely hear that it's coming from a place of fear just like everybody else fears him because he's blowing up cities so he leaves the un 
and goes to Singapore. And his goal is to destroy Singapore. He's throwing asteroids at Singapore. Meanwhile, the characters from the par paradigm are hearing the alarm like go off and they're like oh my gosh he's destroying a whole city we gotta go over there so they have the teleporter and i'll talk about these robots here in a little bit so they go into singapore to go and try to rescue people but they have a teleporter so they can't get everybody out so cubit is just begging for the life of these people and here's gilgamos right there with bet noir and they're married that that relationship is really complex but you can find out for yourself what i mean by that and this is where you get a little bit of a flashback right with cube cubit and the plutonian when they were friends so that's what he calls him he begs him tony no give me back the quantum jumper so all these people we can get out of here and the plutonian just looks at him and says choose 10 and this is when Q Qubit just snaps. He's like, what, what do you mean 10? These There's millions of people here. They're innocent. And he says it again. Choose 10. And he starts choosing 10 people. And then the Plutonian says that's what it feels like. And they go. Qubit leaves with 10 people out of the millions in Singapore. And the Plutonian does what he was set out to do. From the moment that he heard the heartbeat of the senator. He sinks Singapore. And that is what the world is dealing with. Now, I want to come back to this robot and then we'll look at the rest of the issues here without going that deep. I don't want to spoil anything else. So, the Justice League members, or the paradigm really, have to figure out a way to put a stop to this character, this, this godlike creature that they've called a friend for years. And they are just at wit's end. You know, they're going to his ex-girlfriend, asking her if he has any weaknesses. Did he have Earth parents that maybe they can use? She tells him a little bit, and you get to find out more about his past. You actually see a little bit of his childhood here through these pages. But what Qubit decides to do, because his power comes from technology, that's, that's what he uses against villains, but now he's got to use it against his friend. What he decides to do is pretty much build the <laughs> the only person that the Plutonian is scared of. He decides to build robot versions of this character, and this is Modius. So Modius was the supervillain to the Plutonian, and it's the only character or the only person that the Plutonian is scared of. And the reason he decides to build these bots is because Modius has been missing for a few years. Nobody knows where he is. Maybe he's gone into hiding. And these bots not only are to kind of drive fear in the, to the Plutonian if he ever comes to their secret lair, but also their job is to find Modius, to find his whereabouts so they can go and get him and try to defeat the Plutonian. So they're at that desperate for help. They go and team up with super villains, maybe. Now, those are the first four issues, and series just keeps getting crazier and crazier with lots of twists and turns. I didn't even talk about other characters like Volt or Bette Noir and her relations with the Plutonian. But you can find out for yourself, because there's so many surprises in here that even doing the first four issues, a deep dive of those, doesn't really spoil what happens. Because... You don't know if he's being controlled by a supervillain. You don't know if he was always a villain to begin with. You don't know if that's his mission, if something clicked in him that made him snap and hate humanity. You don't know if this is an alternate reality. It gets crazy, and the more you read it, the more you want to know. It is definitely one of those page-turners that does not disappoint. The ending of issue 37, to me, is one of the most beautiful endings and perfect endings that you could have to a... A, a, a story like this because it's such a dark story with like no hope at all like what's gonna happen how can how can earth survive how can these heroes defeat this godlike villain well things happen i and i promise it, it goes into places i didn't think that it was going to i read the series a couple of times and to me it it's definitely top three favorite mark wade stories ever it's up there with kingdom come and it's up there with his run on Flash. It's up there with the um, 
Empire and his history of the Marvel Universe. I really like that book. And I said top three. Maybe I'll do a top ten favorite Mark Wade stories. But, oh my gosh, it deserves a spot on that list. There's a reason why people praise this book. And the four issues alone is known as the first story arc. That's the hook. That's what gets people to read. What ended up happening, his past, what made him snap, or was he always evil? You can find that out for yourself. The journey there is so good, though. It's dark and bleak at times, but I, that last page, you know, there's a little bit of... I don't know how, how should I put it without spoiling it? Hope? Let's just say that. Now, the other question, of course, that people are going to ask, is there anything that could make him turn back, right? It is called Irredeemable. So maybe, maybe he can turn into a good guy again. Now, the 37 issues, the first 20 are all drawn by Peter Krause, who's got a phenomenal art style. It's very, to me, it kind of reminds me of, like, Brent Anderson, um, a little bit of, like, the classic storytellers. Now, after issue number 20, Peter Krause kind of takes a step back and lets... Um, what is his name? Diego Barreto do the finishes. So he does the layouts and then Diego Barreto does the finishes and then eventually he ends up leaving the book with issue number 29. So issue number 30 is really just Diego Barreto. Uh, and I think Eduardo Barreto, I don't know if that's his brother or, or maybe his father, does the inks for the rest of the series. But that is pretty much the pitch to Irredeemable. There's also the Incorruptible Issues 25 and 26, which are all part of the Redemption crossover. So they're mapped perfectly. And there's also the Irredeemable Special, which was not collected in the hardcovers. So this was not collected in the hardcovers. And you can find out exactly what that is and when it takes place. Now, the thing that is missing from here, here's your Afterwards by Grant Morrison. And it, it's the one that showed up in the hardcover. And it's the one that's been collected in the trade paperbacks. Uh, you get the series credits, but what's not in here are the covers to the issues. You have the John Cassidy. I believe these are the covers to the trade paperbacks. And here's a little bit of the credits. But you don't have covers between chapters. You just get the chapter breaks. So that is what's missing from this particular collection. Again, it is a soft cover. This is glued binding. Paper stock they're using here. It's this really thick, glossy paper. It's actually thicker than the um, omnibus editions that they used before in the past. But that is irredeemable. That was really fun to do a deep dive of the first four issues. Gosh, these videos would take forever, though, if I did all 37 issues. Uh, but that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing this edition of Irredeemable... Don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and build of this deluxe edition library. I'm not sure what they're calling it. I think it's just called The Complete Irredeemable by Mark Wade Paperback. It's not an omnibus. And I think if you search for it for just The Complete Irredeemable, that's the way you're going to find it. But if you have any questions, leave them down below. And what did you think of Irredeemable if you've read the story? Are you holding out for the hardcovers? Is this the way that you ended up buying it? Did you, do you have the original hardcovers or did you get the trade paperbacks? And yeah, where do you rank it amongst Mark Wade's writings? I would love to know where you would put that on a list of, let's say, top five. Anyway, this is the Uncanny Omar. Thank you so much for watching. Check out our Patreon and Spreadshop. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love. <laughs>